have to um thank you dana thank you very much uh, for taking your time tonight uh to talk about a topic i think it's, it's gonna it's gonna become extremely important as time progresses, and i think you will see uh, myopia in children past present and future my name is Donnie Saw. I'm a chief and professor here at the Gavin Herbert Dye Institute, the UCI Health and Pediatric Ophthalmology Department. Um, and I welcome every one of you for uh, joining us tonight. And I hope uh, this uh, meeting um, is an informative, educational, but also entertaining. So without uh, further ado, I think I will go and get started. Uh, I have no financial interest on any of the topics that I'll be discussing tonight. And also, I want to thank you for joining us. And also, would like to uh, thank Dr. Jason Yam, who is a the, who's the um, um, working who works at Hong Kong Children's Hospital, and he's the world expert on this particular topic. And he has actually, you will see that many of the literature is written on this topic. Actually, it comes from his department. First, uh, basically, I want to achieve four objectives. What is myopia? and what is the prevalence and causes and the impact of COVID-19 for the last two and a half years, and how do we treat it? And hopefully all of you um, uh, will have a much better understanding on this topic and you can uh, relay this information to your neighbors and your friends and colleagues. First, when we talk about myopia, uh, it means that you're nearsighted or it's a nearsightedness, or some people call it short-sightedness. Um, the distant object is blurry and near object is clear. So if you're far-sighted, that means that things that are far away are clear and things close are blurred. Um, so here uh, you have a picture diagram. In patients without any nearsightedness, you can see the image, the light entering the eye, and focuses right at the retina, the back of the eye that we call macula. In patients with nearsightedness, the light focuses front of the retina, and that is nearsightedness or myopia. So I'm gonna start using the term myopia moving forward. So this is what they would see. When, they look, when they're looking at the world, and if you have normal vision, you can see everything clearly. But if you have nearsightedness, Anything that's close to you is going to be clear, but anything far away is going to be blurred. So I hope that makes sense. Um, what are the symptoms and signs of nearsightedness in pediatric patients? So the, you'll see these kids like squinting, and they will complain of headaches, uh, uh, the eye straining, and um, they would complain of just not being able to see. And when you see them at home, they're just glued to TV. They're like they're very close in proximity. Uh, so that is a sign that your child may be nearsighted and needs to be evaluated. So let's talk about this a little bit more in detail. So why does the image focus in front of the retina? So normally it should be right in the back right here. Can you see the arrow okay, Luis? Okay, so the image should fall right at the phobia or the macula right in the back of the eye, but some patients, it actually falls in front. So what causes that? Well, there are mainly two reasons. One is that something happened to the eyeball and it has elongated, it's actually gotten longer. So the focal point is no longer at, at the back of the eye. The focal point actually has moved back further. Second is that something happened to the cornea or the, or the lens that's making the light converge quicker so that the light doesn't fall right at the macula, it falls front. So something happened. And we're going to talk about that a little bit more in detail. So what are the five most common causes of nearsightedness? So first is that there's a change in the power of the lens, which is right here. So when you develop cataract, that clear lens becomes opaque. And that's what we call the cataract. And Unfortunately, babies and pediatric patients can actually develop cataracts. So if, uh, um, so congenital cataract will be one of the causes, but the power of the lens can change due to osmotic changes 
in diabetes. So if you have a child that's urinating more frequently, and we call it polyuria, or has a, a disease such as galactosemia, uremia, or certain medications can cause a change of the power, um, you got to think about those type of things before you start thinking about other things. Number two is a change in the lens. We talked about the cataract and change in the lens position. So the lens is normally right behind the cornea, but if that lens for some reason moves more anteriorly to the front as a result of medications or trauma, then you got to think about uh, uh, that can result in um, myopia. A uh, change in the cornea, there's a condition called keratoconus, which is a, uh, um, uh, it, which is a uh, connective tissue disorders that involves the cornea. If the corneal curvature becomes abnormal, then that light will not focus on the back. Also, if you're wearing contact lenses that's extremely dry or that's causing corneal warpage or corneal changes, that can make you nearsighted. Also, if the eyeball grows, if let's say this is the size of a normal eyeball, and if the eyeball grows from this length to this as a result of a connective tissue disorders, such as in Marfan syndromes or ehlers Danlos syndromes, and we're gonna talk about that in just a little bit, or patients with, retin, uh, uh, with the uh, retinopathy of prematurity, babies who are born early, or glaucoma. Unfortunately, glaucoma can occur not just in adults, but in pediatric, even in babies. And surgical procedures can cause myopia as well. So what are the ocular diseases that's associated with myopia? As you can, you can see this beautiful child, albinisms, along with congenital glaucomas, and keratoconus, and uh, gyrate atrophy. Uh, so there are many different ocular conditions that can cause nearsightedness. What are some of the multi-system diseases? Uh, that's the connective tissue disorders that I talked about earlier. Marfan's, well, Marcusani's, uh, Noblock, Ehlers-Danlos, Stickler syndrome. So, so these are some of the rare conditions that can cause um, multi-system disease along with, uh, along with the uh, uh, myopia. And the most common is the diabetes, of course, in pediatric patients but also medication. This is something that most people overlook. Topamax for seizure uh, control. This can cause displacement of the lens entirely and result in myopia. Sulfonamides, Dimox or acetazolamide that people use for seasickness, it's very common. Diuretics, spinalectone for hypertension, promethazine, uh, uh, it's actually a, um, uh, a for nausea and vomiting, Bactrim, antibiotics, isosorbide dinitrate for angina, bromocryptine, uh, so for a, a various types of neurological disorders. These are the various medications that can actually cause myopia. So you gotta think about those things too. Now, how common is this uh, myopia? How big is this problem? Well, I want you to look at this graph very carefully. Back in 2000, uh, roughly about 22% of the pediatric patients had myopia, but that number has grown in 20 years up to 33%. So the growth has been almost, uh, uh, it's been about uh, eight to 10% every year. That number has been growing. And it is thought that by 2050, more than 50% of the children around the world would be myopic. But this COVID actually changed everything. And I'm going to talk about that just a little bit more in detail. I think that number, unfortunately, is actually going to be a lot sooner than we think. Um, in Hong Kong or any places in Asia, there's a highest prevalence of myopia. Uh, in Hong Kong, as, as of, um, um, excuse me, that's 2019, um, before COVID, uh, the, the numbers were, by the time you're 12 years of age, your chance of having myopia is 50 and as an adult, 72%. So it's more likely than not, you'll be myopic. Um, so how are we doing in the United States? According to the uh, Kaiser Permanente Southern California Pediatric Eye Exam result, uh, roughly about 36% of the pediatric patients, uh, just over a third, 
is myopic. And that doesn't that shouldn't really surprise you because think about all the kids that's wearing glasses in this country. But that number is actually much greater in urban area, like for example, here in Southern California. Uh, but in rural areas like Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma, those, the, that number is actually dramatically lower at 15.7%. Now, what are the risk factors of myopia? Um, so there are genetic factors and environmental factors, and they both play a significant role. Uh, so first, the, uh, we're gonna talk about congenital, familiar, sporadic, and medical uh, 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 factors. And then for environment, we're gonna talk about near outdoor lights and socioeconomic conditions and lifestyle. So this is extremely important. If both parents are significantly nearsighted, greater than six diopters, the chance of the child having myopia or having needing glasses is extremely high. As a matter of fact, it's about 12 fold the increase. Now, then you're gonna say, Doc, what is six diopters? Well, let's talk about this a little bit. So if you have one diopter of myopia, that means that anything that's uh, three feet away is clear. If you have two diopters, it's half that. So anything that's about 1.5 feet away, it's clear. If you have six diopters of myopia, your focal point or the area, the point where everything is clear is, is only seven inches away. So this kid that's reading a book right here, this kid probably has about six diopters of myopia right here. So by looking at the child and looking at their behavior, many times that I can approximate their refractive errors by just looking at their behavior. Um, now, if parents uh, is, uh, are myopic, um, what is the chance of child, uh, that their child having myopia? It's 12 times higher. Uh, so you should almost expect that if you, if both mom and dad have myopia greater than six doctors, the chi that child, having myopia, the chances is, is it's, uh, it's, um, it's extremely high. And also, the, if the child develops myopia at an earlier age, the age of myopia diagnosis and parents having myopia, that's the most import, important indicator that the, the child's gonna have significant progression of the myopia. It's very, very important, okay? Um, and what are the other factors that's associated with a significant myopia? Believe it or not, patients, a parent's education, higher the education that the parents have, there's a higher chance that the child will be myopic. And uh, this is very interesting. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in detail. And then outdoor time. If you're spending less time in outdoor, your chance of developing myopia is highly likely. And near work also was very uh, highly correlated with the chance of developing myopia, but none of the other things that we actually studied. And this actually had been reported in this literature. And education is an important factor. As a matter of fact, um, it, this is actually very interesting. There's a very little myopia in societies in general, which children do not go to school. Um, and I actually involved with the I'm involved with the medical mission programs and I actually found that this is actually um, very, very uh, true. And within a school system, prevalence of myopia increases when the ch uh, children is getting older and receiving higher education and more schooling. Children having better academic results tend to have higher degree of myopia. Myopia epidemic region tends to have a pattern of early onset educational pressure. So this has actually been um, um, all been reported. So now let's talk about the outdoor. If you spend less than two hours per day outdoor, your chance of developing myopia is greater. And this actually has been published in multiple literatures. Uh, so um, as a matter of fact, there's a 2% increase in risk of um, risk for every one hour uh, one hour or more of near activities per day. So if you're spending more time reading, especially in a shorter distance, your chance of developing myopia is much, much greater. So, so I just said, patients who spend 
less time outdoor, reading and using a tablet or phone in near activities will increase the chance of myopia. So then you may say, wait, was like, uh, you know, many of the children, like my children, that's what they were doing during COVID. So would that have any impact on their on their uh, refractive errors and, and development of myopia? Well, fortunately, there was a significant, there was a, uh, there were many studies that's actually coming out as we speak. So we talked about the changes due to COVID-19 for children reduced an amount of time they were spending outdoor and increased in near activities, and they were not spending much time in the park uh, with other kids. So what in that impact did they have? So this nice, very, very nice study that was done by Dr. Yam and his group looked at two cohorts. They looked at the pre-COVID-19 cohorts and then COVID-19 cohorts, and they compared the two. So, and what they did was that they looked at the vision, they, look at, they looked at their cycloplegic autorefractions, meaning their, um, how, you know, how, how near set they were, and then they measured the length of the eyeball see if there was any progression or increase in length of the eyeball. Um, the, so the primary outcomes included the incidence of myopia uh, with the other things that I mentioned. And then secondary outcome was that how much time did they actually spend outdoor and how much near time and near work did they do? So let's look at the uh, baseline demographics and you can see it's a very similar age group, a male and sex ratio about the same, axial length, prior to um, uh, like at the initial visit, looking at the extra length of the eyeball, it was actually comparable in both groups. Um, and it was actually, the, these two cohorts were very similar. Um, so now the first group, the, the, the first group is the COVID-19 cohorts, meaning these are patients that were, uh, that were recruited right before COVID. And then we observed them for seven months. Now remember, seven months, not years, seven months. And we looked at their vision, axial length, and then their refractive error. And these are the same cohorts, a similar type of cohort, but pre-COVID. So they were examined before, so their examination were completed before the COVID started. So what we found, what they found was that, first of all, the outdoor time reduced significantly from 1.27 hours down to 0.41 hours. And then second, the total near work time increased dramatically. I mean, that makes sense because most of these kids actually have to go to school on Zoom, um, uh, like we're doing right now. And then the screen time increased significantly uh, by up, they increased by 4.5 hours. Um, so what was the estimated annual incidence of myopia uh, comparing these two groups? Well, pre-COVID-19, the annual incidence of myopia was about 11%. And that number almost tripled during COVID in just seven months, in seven months, um, which is actually alarming. Uh, this is uh, something that we really need to pay attention. And then how myopic did they become? On the average, a pre, uh, the, the pre-COVID-19 cohort was about minus 0.41 diopter, so 0.4 diopter. But for the COVID-19, while they were doing all these near activities, the re average refractive error was minus eight. So it was a twofold increase, twofold, in such a short amount of time. And then the axial length, the eyeball crew by 1.5 times, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, uh, the, the increase was 0.28 millimeters for the COVID-19. The 0.28 millimeter does not seem like it's a lot, but I'm gonna just tell you, it is significant. That is a significant growth. Um, <clears throat> so then you may say, oh my goodness, uh, what do we do? How do we prevent these myopic epidemics that we're experiencing right now that was even sped up by the uh, COVID-19? Um, so what are the solutions? So there are five options that I'm gonna just uh, uh, bring, uh, that I'm gonna uh, um, uh, mention. First is increasing outdoor time, good reading habits, regular eye check, 
pharmacologic and optical methods. And we're gonna talk about that one by one. So increasing outdoor time. First, by increasing by 40 minutes of outdoor activities as, uh, at school compared to usual activity resulted in 23% relative reduction in incidence of myopia after three years. And this actually had been reported very nicely um, by this particular group. And this, another study showed that by increasing the outdoor, by making the outdoor activities mandatory. So these kids starting 2011, as you can see here, it was, it, it got incorporated in their school activities where they actually had to spend two hours outdoor. So before 2011, it was not part of the, the mandatory activities, but after 2011, they instituted this nationwide program and, and, and saw exactly how they wanted to see the impact on their uh, on the progression of myopia. And you can see the, they were able to halt and even decrease, uh, decrease the incidence of myopia from grade one to three. For the grade four to six, they were able to halt it. So this actually, uh, this is a, um, uh, this was a monumental task. Um, but it was an extremely important study that showed that the outdoor activities played an important role. So our current recommendations, my current recommendations, this is a, is a, is a spending at least two hours per day, 14 hours per week. Uh, here in Southern California, we have a beautiful weather, so there's really no excuse. And so they need to spend more time outside. And good reading habits. So do not read for a prolonged period of time without taking breaks. So I recommend to all my patients and my kids, read for 30 minutes and take a little break. So prolonged reading with the spasm of these uh, in intrinsic eye muscles is not good for the eyes either. It can actually cause a lot of straining and it can cause spasms. Uh, so I recommend uh, reading for 30 minutes or less and take five minutes of break and then and going back. And then do not read too close. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit more detail. And then also do not avoid staying uh, in the dark environment in reading. So why is that important? Uh, so here, the screen time guidelines uh, by the WHO and American Academy of Pediatrics, if you're less than one, uh, and I see these babies uh, in a uh, stroller, you know, they have a phone right in front of them. And, and that's actually how they, uh, the moms actually encourage them to go to sleep. No. Please, please do not do that. Uh, that is not good for uh, good for their eyes. And I don't think that it's actually the blue light emitting screen, the LED screen is actually not good for their sleep cycles either. So I recommend uh, zero a time for any type of, uh, of, 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 of any phone activities for kids less than one. If they're between two to four kindergarten, I used to say two hours. But now I actually recommend down to one hour of screening time after reviewing all these data and having a lot of discussions with my colleagues. And I would say this is actually, I, I support this uh, uh, recommendation. And then when they're in preschool, less than two hours of screen time in addition to the screen time for the school, uh, for the classes, because they're already spending quite a bit of time uh, on screen with their uh, classes. Um, with or without COVID-19. So I recommend less than two hours of screen time for leisure. And then secondary school students avoid long period of screen time. What does that mean? You know, I'm gonna say um, uh, the, uh, uh, the one of the research papers uh, that, uh, that, uh, that came out this year uh, stated that the, the screen time for young adults was eight to 12 hours a day during this COVID. Eight to 12 hours. That was actually, I could not even believe that. Uh, so I'm gonna say that is way too long. So I you know, typically say somewhere between two to four hours of a screen time uh, should be sufficient. And as a matter of fact, we are actually in the process of developing a computer screen, a, a phone app uh, that actually turns off after so many hours of uh, near activities that you can preset that the parents have control. And electronic reading distance for phones, uh, 30 centimeters. So 30 centimeters about the pair. So it's about 
I'm going to say it's about 30 centimeters about this distance right here. And then for iPads or any type of tablets, uh, we recommend 40 centimeters. And for a computer, like we like you're sitting right now, uh, is 50 centimeters. So just have a like a small measuring stick and try to guesstimate the distance. And if you see a child that's holding it very close, encourage them to pull it further away. Because by holding it close, you're what they're doing is that they're encouraging these eye muscles and the eyeball to grow and to become more and more nearsighted. And then also, how about the lighting? Why is dark lighting not good? Every thousand lux increase in average light intensity slow down annual growth rate of the eye axis by 0 0.05 millimeters. So what this means is that the eyeball tends to grow in a darker setting, in a darker setting when you read for a prolonged period of time. So the light intensity is about 10, uh, 100 to 500 lux with the desk light. And in the shade, it's about 5,000 lux. And in the light, like in a play area, it actually, that number goes up to 10,000 to, uh, uh, to 30,000 lux. So the difference between a light outdoor and inside and, and with this uh, inside with the desk light, it's actually, um, it's, it's almost 100 times, 100 times. So uh, we recommend that avoid reading in a dark environment and always have a table lamp plus indoor light, if possible. That will increase the lux to about 600. And if you, if it's possible, have a window right next to where you read. Uh, so that will increase to about 5,000 lux. So that will be good. So what are some of the other treatments that's available? We, I actually, I have been using atropine with a quite a bit of uh, uh, high success. So a possible mechanism is that it actually prevents the uh, what we call the choroid, which is a blood vessels, and the sclera, which is the white part of the eye, Prevent it prevents it from elongation, so it just fixes it, and also it emits eyeball what we call accommodation, and it can slow down the progression of the myopia. And I typically uh, treat patients between four to uh, fourteen, and uh, patients with the earlier onset of myopia, especially if the parents both have significant myopia already. Uh, I don't. I think it's actually a good idea to be aggressive and start uh, uh, considering treatment for these patients with the uh, atropine. Now, there are various concentrations uh, that's available and extensive studies have been performed by Adam study and LAMP study. And Dr. Um, uh, Jason Yam, that we, who I just mentioned earlier, actually was one of the uh, lead investigators for these studies uh, uh, in Asia. Uh, and so they're not all the same. They're pluses and minuses. Uh, an appropriate dose of uh, atropine should be used. And I typically recommend using one drop once at nighttime. And photochromic or uh, photogray glasses can be helpful if they become light sensitive, especially kids with uh, light blue eyes. And optical method. Uh, so there's a defocusing spectacles and contact lenses and ortho -K that's available. So what does that mean? So when we talk about uh, the uh, defocus spectacle, when you wear glasses, that image falls, if you wear the proper prescription, uh, that image will fall right at the macula right here in centrally. But what happens in the periphery? So in the periphery, the image doesn't fall on the retina. It actually falls behind the retina uh, with the traditional lenses. And that causes what we call hyperopic defocus. And that causes the eyeball to grow. It's like a stimulus for the eyeball to grow because the image is behind the retina. So that encourages the eye to grow. And, um, and, it, uh, and, and, and so what we try to do is that we place a defocusing lenses so that the image will not fall behind the retina. Or it will fall right on the retina or even front of the retina to discourage the eyeball to grow. So how do we do this? There is a lens lens and also there's dims. There are different types of uh, lenses that's being developed um, by big companies uh, with the concentric rings of a, uh, that, has a, that has a myopic defocusing power. So when you look through the center, it's clear, but then paracentral area, it's blurred. And it actually call, uh, so it's a, it discourages the eye to grow. 
And this is a paper that's written, and it actually has shown that it can de it can actually uh, uh, slow down the axial elongation and also myopic progression significantly. And it is still under investigation, and um, uh, our colleagues around the world are actually participating in the study. And we're trying to get into, uh, we are also trying to participate in the study and, and see if they, um, is to see if, if there's a significant impact. So if you have any uh, family members that are interested in participating in this type of study, please let me know. And also multifocal contact lenses. So this is a, uh, it, it, there were actually, those. this is a landmark study that was performed. And what it does is that the multifocal contact lenses, again, with the single vision contact lenses, the image will fall right at the, at the, at the retina, but in peripherally, still they will have this peripheral hyperopic defocus. So by placing, by them wearing uh, uh, multifocal contact lenses, they can actually have the images fall from part of the retina in different areas because these multifocal contact lenses have different power depending on which concentric uh, areas that, uh, that you're looking through. And the studies have shown that high ad power uh, can decrease Excuse me, sorry. Uh, the high ad power uh, can slow down the progression uh, to 0 0.60 versus a single vision, which is 1.50. So there was an improvement of 0.45 adopters of improvement. I, obviously, it's not, a, it's not a huge improvement, but it was a modest improvement. And also, it showed that there was a um, axial elongation benefit as well, too. High ed power had a growth of 0.42, and the single vision had a growth of 0.66. Uh, and all, uh, there's also ortho K. And what it is is that, so you, this, let's say this is the shape of your eyeball in the front, and this front of the eye is too steep. So what we do is that we place a, um, a contact lenses of certain shape that's somewhat rigid, uh, that's a, a rigid or gas permeable contact lenses, and then you're reshaping the front of the cornea overnight. And then the lenses are typically removed during the day. And this is what they would walk around with during the daytime with a clear air vision. But then when they go to sleep, they would have to put the contact lens back on to reshape the cornea because the cornea always want to revert back to where it was before. It's just like charging a car, like charging your Tesla or a hybrid car, a plug-in hybrid car. The, of course, the, the disadvantage is that you would have to continuously wear these contact lenses uh, at nighttime um, or else the, the benefit can wean off. Um, now, the, 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 this is a retard, uh, retardation of the myopia and ortho-K um, uh, study, and it showed that the ortho-K patient had uh, axial length benefit. Uh, these patients actually... Um, uh, the uh, by end of the uh, two years, ortho K had 0.36 millimeter. Uh, uh, um, the single vision had 0.63 millimeter elongation compared to the ortho K of 0.36. So it actually had some uh, benefit of the um, uh, of the uh, of the wearing of ortho K with the elongation of the uh, the uh, uh, of the the eyeball. Now. The, with these contact lenses, a close observation is essential uh, because uh, us being a, a tertiary or quaternary care center, we do take care of uh, uh, some of these complications. So recurrent erosions, infections, um, uh, corneal pigmentations, uh, corneal ulcers, even diplopia. Patients actually can do develop double vision. If the, the contact lenses are not completely centered and if it's slightly decentered, it can cause irregular astigmatisms resulting in a double vision. So what is the best therapy? Uh, possibly a combined therapy. Uh, so outdoor time. Uh, I, we do recommend uh, uh, spending at least two hours a day. Let the kids play and that's what they're supposed to do. Um, you know, think about uh, when we were growing up, uh, you know, we didn't spend you know, six hours, eight hours looking at a phone or studying like that. That's just unnatural. So do things that's natural for kids, let them play, uh, and then have a, uh, 
a uh, good reading habit. Don't read for too long and take frequent breaks and don't hold it too close and don't hold it to, uh, don't uh, read in a dark setting. And regular eye check is going to be critical and atropine eye drops. Is, is, is an option, defocusing spectacles. It is not FDA approved in this country, so it's still under investigation. Um, and then multifocal contact lenses and ortho K are possible, uh, are other possible options. Thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. Sa, that was great. Um, so if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and we can let Dr. Sa answer your questions um, in person. Um, if Dr. I don't hear, yeah, if I don't hear any questions then I'm gonna assume that everyone understood everything. So I'm gonna start asking. Um, Dr. Sa, maybe you could explain why being outside is so beneficial in terms of the focusing distance. Yes. So uh, the being outside actually has multiple benefits. Uh, uh, so number one is that the um, when you're outside, you're not focusing any near objects. You're focusing on things uh, far away. That relaxes your ciliary muscles inside the eye. So that relaxes the muscle. Number one. Number two. Uh, we talked about the lux, the light intensity, that uh, we, uh, the, the studies have found being in dark setting, um, uh, the, being darker, that actually uh, has a, a, that increases the chance of extra length and also increases the risk of myopia. So, uh, so increase in uh, light intensity, the ambient light is actually, it also has another beneficial, uh, a huge beneficial impact. Byron, there's a um, there's a question in oh, the sure, chat. Sure. I'm sorry, there's a question in the chat asking if eye drops reduce myopia. I'm just going to turn this off a little bit. Okay. Yes, uh, the uh, there are different doses of atropine that's available. Uh, in the past, the Adam study used uh, one percent atropine, but unfortunately, many of those patients develop significant uh, uh, light sensitivity and also uh, an inability to read. So that those actually were, it actually went down to 0 0.01 uh, and 0 0.03 and 0 0.05. Uh, so the, the, the studies have found that the uh, point, the, the lower concentration of atropine has been just as effective uh, as a higher concentration of, of uh, atropine. So uh, we do, um, uh, I think it's extremely effective and I've actually, been using um, uh, the uh, low dose atropine for about, I want to say five years. Yes, it's extremely um, uh, effective. Great, and thank Byron you. has his hand up. Yeah, Byron. Yeah, hey guys. Hey, first of all, thanks for letting me join the chat. Um, this has been awesome, very educational, especially for a guy that's been working in the eyewear industry for a long time, like like you know, Donnie. Um, but so, so I guess my question would be, you know, the time outside is great for, for busy adults and stuff like that. Is there, are there particular exercises that you could, you could say like, oh, focus on 50 yards, 100 yards, 150 yards and like cycle. They're like kind of exercise programs that you can just kind of make sure you're, you're exercising your eye or anything like that that you know of. So Byron, uh, I'm going to just joke. Uh, Byron, do you have any kids? No. Okay. <laughs> you know, let me. Not let yet. Me, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, when you're dealing with the two-year-old, four-year-old, six-year-old, you, you know, you're busy just trying to keep them alive. Uh, you know, you, you're trying to uh, uh, have them focus on different uh, distances. It's going to be virtually impossible. But just the fact that they're outside playing in a playground with other kids, that in itself is actually, uh, uh, the studies have found that that, that, in, that in itself is actually beneficial. So I don't think they need to work on any particular distance. Um, uh, but just the fact that they're outside in ambient light uh, with the, uh, you know, 10,000 lux of light intensity, uh, looking at, you know, uh, looking at the mountain, looking at the, uh, the trees far away uh, and focusing on various objects and exercising those muscles is good for them. Yeah, I was, I was trying to get you to prescribe all the youngsters to get out there on the golf course. <laughs> yes, yes. I, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Byron? Golf is an excellent, excellent sport. 
I actually, I have three kids and uh, they all play golf starting at the age of five. Um, it was actually scary trying to watch them uh, hit the ball, but fortunately I only got hit by them once, so I, I survived. Michael has a question about the computer size of the computer screen. He says, it sounds like there's an argument for larger computer screens so you can increase your distance to the screen. Would that be correct? Yes, that is absolutely correct. Uh, so, uh, you know, I see young kids uh, trying to do their homework and trying to read a book on their phone. That is probably the worst thing that you can do. So bigger the screen, further you are, you're relaxing those accommodating, uh, you're losing your uh, relaxing those accommodations. So further you are away from the object that you're focusing, it's better it is for your eyes. Yes. Great, and Lily has posted a question in there for you, Dr. Sa. Hi, Lily. How much can the eye drop correct myopic? And I'm six, uh, I'm six five, I'm minus 6.5 both eyes. Uh, will I be able to see without glasses? How often do you use? So Lily, uh, what age, uh, what, what's the age group are you referring to? Uh, I'm in 50s. Okay, no, okay. So I just wanna make sure the, the title of this talk, I uh, thank you very much for, ask, uh, for asking that question. This is for uh, myopia during development. So by the age of, I'm gonna say 16 to 18, your eyes are fully grown. Uh, so typically, if you are progressively becoming more and more myopic uh, after that age, then you really have to think about other potential pathologic conditions, or you may have some connective tissue issues. But uh, so the atropine is, has been effective for kids uh, from the age of four up to about 12 to 14 years of age. So this is actually a more, uh, we're looking at uh, uh, younger patients while the eyes are growing. So what we're trying to do is that this is not a treatment. We're trying to prevent them from getting worse. So by placing atropine, you're preventing them from getting worse and worse and worse. Lily, did I answer your question? So for kids that who do these jobs, uh, do they get dependent over or are these treatment for myomyotopia? Yes. Okay. So the kids uh, with the, uh, this, let's say the kid has a mild myopia and we're trying to prevent them from, um, uh, from developing a significant myopia. So we will place these patients on very low concentration of atropine. And typically for Asians with the darker eyes, it doesn't have a, a significant impact. But uh, for someone like Greg uh, with the beautiful blue eyes or Richard here, and Michael and uh, Dana, uh, they, they, uh, people with a lighter eye color, the eyes tend to dilate a little bit more and they become more sensitive. Uh, so for those patients, the, uh, the, uh, the um, photo gray or transitional lenses where you, you could, they could wear these glasses that turns dark when they go outside in the sun. So it'd be beneficial. But for most people, you don't notice any uh, difference. So we could put this in but the impact on your eye is minuscule. And you'll be able to read as well. Dr. So, given that summer's um, upon us, do you have any recommendations for sunglasses for kids? Yeah, so uh, thank you. The, um, fortunately, our lens actually has a, you know, uh, I think our human eyes are just amazing. Uh, you know, more in my study, I've been studying eyeballs now for, uh, you know, over, uh, Actually, I'm getting close to 30 years of uh, learning about the eyeballs. And um, it, it truly fascinates me of uh, how amazing and how protective and resilient these eyeballs are. And it actually has a built-in UV protections. Um, uh, so uh, if the child does not want to wear glasses, you don't have to force it upon them. And I, I think I just wearing a hat or wearing a cap, especially in this environment in Southern California with bright sun, I think caps are uh, sufficient. But if they tend, if they have a light uh, color eyes, uh, for example, Byron, I know he has a little bit lighter eye color. Uh, so for those uh, kids who are light sensitive, that's, that's not wanting to go outside, for those kids, I would highly recommend wearing sunglasses with additional UV protection. Those I think will be excellent option. 
Great questions, by the way. And those sunglasses don't have to be expensive, right? They can just be- Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, so the very expensive, uh, you know, that's another topic that we could talk about. I actually, one of the things that I enjoy doing is that I, yeah, inventions, uh, you know, I invent uh, glasses. So uh, the very expensive glasses uh, that has a 99 UV uh, blockage, uh, you know, you're going to have to spend quite a bit. But if you go down to a $5 glasses, just a cheap sunglasses, you know, uh, those actually glasses block out about 97 or 96%. So the difference is not much greater. So, uh, uh, so the, the, no, just any cheap glasses uh, would be suffice. Yes. Great. Dr. Saul, I have a question for you. Yeah, please. So I know uh, this is more, this talk is about being myopic, but how about uh, farsightedness for kids? Are there certain signs? Or is it rare for kids to to be farsightedness? So uh, just to let you know, in uh, in United States, uh, in United States, outside of Southern California, uh, for a population of African Americans and Hispanics and um, uh, Caucasians. Uh, there, it's more common for them to be farsighted than nearsighted. Uh, so okay. it's a very, uh, you know, it's very um, ethnicity uh, dependent. Uh, so mild degree of mild degree of farsightedness is actually completely acceptable. But if you're significantly farsighted, what that's going to cause is that number one, uh, when you're trying to focus on anything close, you remember I just told you they can't see anything close. So they will avoid looking at things close. Number two, the eyes will start crossing. So if you notice a child with the eyes that's intermittently crossing, uh, that child needs to be examined for farsightedness. Great. Does anybody have any other questions they'd like to ask Dr. Saab before we sign off for the evening? Greg, uh, 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 Mr. Soloway, obviously you're very nearsighted. Do you have any questions for me? I guess not, huh? <laughs> no, no, no questions. But uh, yeah, it ran ran in my family, and I'm married to an Asian, so our kids uh, had no chance. <laughs> yeah, I, I hate to tell you, I, Greg, uh, you're about minus ten, so you're about minus ten doctors, so you're greater than minus six. And if your wife is already nearsighted, then your chance of uh, your children needing glasses, like I said, is 12 times greater than general population. And then your grandkids too. Uh, so, well, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for your time tonight. And uh, I look forward to uh, uh, seeing you again at future um, uh, community talks. And we have many more uh, exciting talks uh, that's lined up, that's organized by Louise and uh, Dana. And thank you very much for organizing this meeting. Thank you very much, Dr. Sa. We'll send Thank a recording you. of this lecture to those who registered, so that'll be coming in the next week or so. Thank you very much. Have a good evening, everyone.